welcome to all of you, those of you in the room and those of you online to the Centre for Muslim Christian Studies. My name is Martin Whittingham. Uh, I'll be chairing today's uh, session, which, as you know, will involve more than one speaker. <clears throat> We're very pleased to have uh, Dr. Shafi Fazal Adin with us, and I will introduce him in a moment. But as you know, we also have two respondents to his discussion of his book, Reverend Dr. Tom Wilson and uh, Dr. Shuruk Nagib, who is joining us online. Welcome, Shuruk. I can see you're safely with us now. That's great. Um, so this is our last seminar of the academic year. We will be back in the autumn with a new series, but um, this is drawing to a conclusion our session on broadly defined Christian Muslim relations in the UK. Uh, and we're really pleased today to have with us Dr. Shafi Fazaluddin, who's a researcher at SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, where he did his PhD. Uh, he's also in a previous life been a lawyer in financial services in the city of London. So any of you who are academics who think you work hard, I'm talking to Shafi, I'm not sure we do. But, uh, <laughs> um, but for now, yes, he's concentrating on his work in Quranic studies and his book, which is now out with de Gruyter, Conciliation in the Quran is the subject of today's discussion. So Shafi will present first for around 40 minutes or thereabouts, and then we will have responses from uh, Tom Wilson and then from Shuruk Nagib. And then after that, we will open discussion to questions and comments, both to Shafi, but also to any of the three panelists today. So I hope that's clear enough and I haven't missed anything crucial, in which case I shall hand over this chair a great pleasure to be with you today on this uh, sunny afternoon in Oxford, at least, at the Centre for Muslim Christian Studies. Um, and I want to especially thank Martin for very kindly uh, arranging today's event and to my fellow panellists, to Tom and Sharuk, also for um, participating in this discussion today and to all of you for attending uh, as well and to be, uh, for being our audience today. So thank you very much and a warm welcome to all of you. So this research uh, is taken from uh, the book which Tom has mentioned, which is Conciliation in the Qur'an, um, the Quranic Ethics of Conflict Resolution, uh, which has been published in February this, this year by de Gruyter. And it's my PhD thesis uh, and my research on the subject of conciliation as a thematic study. Um, in terms of my methodology, I went through the entire Qur'an, starting from the beginning, sequentially progressing towards to, through to the end of it, uh, extracting material which I thought was relevant to the subject of conciliation. And I looked at conciliation as a holistic concept. So not just references to particular Arabic terms, but wherever I saw conciliation in the material, uh, whether in terms of a narrative or a linguistic angle, um, all of that material was extracted and analyzed and presented in this book. Um, and the book has six uh, broad chapters. Uh, the first chapter, deals with uh, the notion of bir, which I'm going to open, which, which is really the focus of today's discussion. Um, and that's to do with esoteric transformation of the inner self, if you like. And then after that, it talks about various conflict resolution mechanisms. For example, Ayat al-Dain, which is the longest verse in the Quran, as I'm sure many of you know, which deals with the writing down of financial contracts. Um, and, and, and I argue that one of the reasons for doing that is to reduce the scope for confusion in the certainty of terms in, in contractual arrangements in financial contracts. Um, then I also in that chapter talk about overarching principles, um, such as the famous verse, which many of you will be familiar with, uh, verse 64 from chapter three, Surah Al-Imran, about interfaith dialogue, قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ kitab, say to the people of the scripture, um, and that talks about the common word. So overarching principles which have a conciliatory theme to them. Those are all mentioned in the opening chapter. Chapter two um, gathers material from really the chapters which are most closely associated with conflict um, as a counterbalance to the discussion on conciliation. Uh, and in particular chapters eight and nine of the Quran, which contain many verses regarding um, the circumstances of, of conflict, of military conflict, military engagement, and it contains also the notorious verse, uh, which has come to be known as the sword verse, Ayat al-Qital, uh, verse five of Surah Tawbah. And I discuss the context of those verses in the Quran, their interpretation, their reading, their misreading, um, and explain them in the context of surrounding verses as to what uh, appears to be intended in those passages. I also talk about peace treaties, 
um, which uh, are very pervasive in that discussion, which is often overlooked actually when, when people look at conflict verses, they don't often focus on the fact that interspersed within those verses are actually many verses around peace treaties, um, and which are binding. Uh, and, and there are many verses urging those treaties to be completed as well. Chapter three of the book talks about the notion of Ihsan, uh, which is really the overarching single concept of the whole research. And Ihsan is gracious conduct. Um, and it's, for example, forgiving uh, people who have wronged you or providing benefit to someone who hasn't necessarily provided benefit to you. And, and so being gracious in your conduct and the model of Joseph um, is, is presented in, in a lot of detail, how he um, benefits his brothers who have wronged him and how he re readily forgives them and enables conciliation to occur within the family. Um, and in incredibly, the story of Joseph doesn't feature in, in, in classical studies around sulh and conciliation because the word sulh isn't mentioned and therefore they're completely overlooked, although the story uh, is entirely one of conciliation. Um, chapter four talks about um, man's free will uh, and the choices that man is allowed to make. And although this may seem peripheral to the topic of conciliation, I, I present this discussion because I think it's very important to understand that the Quran is arguing for a situation where humans are free to make choices and are therefore held accountable um, through reward and retribution. And this is fundamental to the purpose of the Quran. And therefore it's not for man to compel another man. Um, and, and this is important in understanding some of the verses around conflict in the Quran, for example, which various writers have sometimes suggested were there to compel people towards making choices or towards a particular um, outcome, particularly in faith. Uh, and I argue that faith is very um, firmly uh, encapsulated as a, as a concept which requires a free choice according to the Quranic verses. Chapter five presents um, a practical and a theoretical model of conciliation in two chapters, chapter 48 and chapter 49, um, which are, I argue, should be read together. And no one has really done this before. People who have structurally analyzed the Quran have never taken these two chapters together in this way. But I argue that they fit together very um, coherently, one being a practical example of conciliation at the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, um, which was a, a landmark peace treaty in Islamic history, and chapter 49, which lays out, I argue, a theoretical paradigm for how to bring about conciliation within different groups in society. I conclude the book with chapter six, which returns to the notion of bir uh, and talks about maintaining human relationships, for example, kin relationships of kin, and also providing social assistance to those in need. Uh, and these themes are very heavily emphasized in the latter part of the Quran. So my chapters follow the themes which are emphasized in that part of the Quran. And so I uh, really will be touching on those points today as well as the first chapter. I'll also be talking about chapter six. Again, these themes of kinship and social assistance. But crucially, I will be arguing that these responsibilities are not restricted to intra-faith relationships they are intended to be transcendental. These principles are intended to um, supersede differences of faith. There are human responsibilities, human kindnesses, uh, which are owed irrespective of differences of faith. And I think this is a very important point that needs to be brought out of these kind of um, scriptural uh, discussions because often assumptions are made and sometimes writers openly say that these teachings are simply for adherence to the faith in terms of their intra-faith relationships. So that's really my argument today is that these duties supersede differences of faith. So having spent a few minutes talking about the book, um, I want to just now um, begin the discussion on bir, uh, the notion of bir. Bir has been translated as virtuous conduct or um, conduct which is dutiful. So duties are owed to an individual, for example, or even duties to God, and, and fulfillment of those duties is, is known as bir. And here, what is very interesting is that, uh, I'll, I'll actually, um, just to explain, sorry, that as I've said, that we're going past now the discussion around interfaith dialogue. So what I'm arguing here is that between faiths, we're not just talking about interfaith dialogue as in a common word, but we're actually talking about common relationships now and, and, and conduct, which um, should be present in, in dealings on an interfaith basis. 
So first of all, I'm going to open with a discussion of verse 177 of chapter two, um, which is the first verse on your, on your list of verses there. And this verse is actually the first verse that I analyze in the book. And it's the first verse that I focused on when I was commencing my traversal of the Quran, looking for material on conciliation. And one of the things that gra um, grabs the attention of the reader straight away is the formulation of the verse. It says, al birra. And it means that bir is not. And this is a very atypical way of introducing a concept to say what it isn't. Um, and also grammatically, birra is in the mansub case, which is also unusual because laysa normally takes a marfu case. And so rather than taking nominative here, it takes an accusative case. And this also is unusual. There are grammatical explanations for that, although it is unusual. Sometimes a khabar, for example, a piece of information which will take the mansub case can be advanced. It's called taqdeem in the sentence. And sometimes that is done for emphasis. So there are grammatical uh, explanations. But one of the commentators who I'll be referring to today, uh, Amin Ahsan Islahi, from the Indian subcontinent, um, and he is from the um, previous century, so he's, he's quite a modern writer. But he says this is uh, So he says that this is by way of distinction. This is in order to make this concept stand out. And so the Quran says that righteousness, and and this is shortly after the passage that talks about the change of the Qibla um, from Jerusalem to Mecca. And so after that discussion, the Quran says, in fact, the direction you face in prayer is not the essence of worship. What matters is the transformation that comes inside of you as a result of that worship. And so this is a correctional focus here. So the Quran says, virtue, piety, is not that you face east or west, but true righteousness, walakin al birra, is in belief. And articles of faith are mentioned in Allah, the last day, the angels, the book, the prophets. All of those are articles of faith. And then it said, it moves on to conduct. It's what al mala ala hubbihi and the giving of wealth in spite of love for it. First and foremost to relatives, the will qurba, and then to the poor, wal yatama, the orphans, wal masakin, the, the needy, wabna uh, sabil, travelers who have a special place in Islam because they are away from their assets and their protective families and so on freeing slaves, establishing prayer and giving zakat. Zakat, again, referring back to charity. And those who fulfill their promises when they make promises as well. And those who are patient. And so all of these qualities are mentioned as what virtue truly constitutes. That it's not simply about facing east or west, but this is the essence of virtuous conduct, dutiful conduct. Razi, um, a pre-modern uh, interpreter of the Quran who writes in Arabic, um, uh, I uh, quote from also in my analysis, he says uh, regarding this verse that, it, that what it emphasizes is So he says that the deeds of the heart, if you like, are more honorable in the law, in the sight of Allah than the uh, actions of the limbs. So he means that what, what happens inside is of more worth in the sight of God than what is happening with the limbs. And this is how he uh, emphasizes this verse. Um, Islahi, coming back to him, in his uh, tafsir, he actually begins an entire new section when he comes to this, this verse. And he says uh, in the margin, in his sum uh, sort of summary of the, of the significance of this verse, he says, Deen mahed, mahez which means in Urdu that religion is not simply the name of a few ritual actions and some external uh, acts. So he's again focusing inwards and saying that true virtue is about what happens inwards. He defines Bir as the fulfillment of rights, be they the rights of God or the rights of his pe people. Now, why is this important to conciliation? Because uh, Abu Nimr. Uh, a, a modern writer quoting from the work of Burton mentions that the non-fulfillment of basic human needs is one of the primary causes of dispute. So actually, the argument is that if people fulfill the rights of other people, then they will avoid disputes in society. In the same way, of course, if they fulfill the rights of God, then also they will have hope of salvation, etc., by extension. 
So from, uh, from this list of concepts that we saw in this verse, we can also take out that kinship is a very important concept. You see here before that the giving of wealth, the first category, the will qurba, relatives, helping relatives is, is even before helping orphans and the poor. Um, and also social justice. These is another uh, important principle that helping the orphans and the, and the, and the, and the, and the masakin, et cetera, this is all mentioned as well. So these are important points which are emphasized. This verse is Medinan, um, and I'm going to highlight from time to time that some of the verses I deal with are Medinan because there's often a perception by some writers such as Kenneth Cragg, um, uh, who, who wrote in his book Muhammad in the Quran, that the Medinan Quran is more belligerent uh, and uh, wasn't as conciliatory as the Meccan Quran. So I'm going to highlight that some of these verses that I'll refer to are actually from the Medinan Quran and that there isn't actually, in my view, a big jump and a change in attitude between the Meccan and the Medinan Quran in the way that some writers have argued. Okay, so just a little bit more on this um, verse uh, before we move on to a, a different uh, topic. So for uh, Razi, uh, for Islahi, sorry, um, one of the other things which he mentions is that fulfillment of agreements, which is mentioned here, uh, those who fulfill their promises, uh, is the basis of, for the fulfillment of all rights and duties towards God and creation. So he considers the fulfilling of promises as very fundamental. So one example I wanted to just cite here is that during the discussions at Hudaybiya, uh, during the peace treaty negotiations, and the, the, the Muslims had come for pilgrimage, and there was a standoff which was about to lead to a war, and they were negotiating peace terms. And at that time, one of the Muslims who had been persecuted had escaped from Mecca and came and threw himself effectively in the court of the prophet and asked for him to protect him from his persecutors in Mecca. And of course, you know, his plight was obviously the marks of torture were upon him, etc. And it would have made sense at that time for the prophet to try to take him into the fold and protect him. But in fact, because the treaty had been made that one of the terms was that if anyone flees from the Meccan side, they would be returned. And that treaty had not been signed at that time. But as a mark of trust, the prophet agreed to return him to the Meccans, despite the, the, the plight that he was obviously in and, and, and the calls of his own people to not do so. But he believed that because he had made that treaty, he would show good faith and implement its terms even before it was signed. And I present this example, which Islahi mentions in his tafsir of this verse, as an example of fulfillment of promises to show that this was a promise that the prophet was keeping to the Meccan polytheists. He was not keeping the promise because he had made it to an adherent of the same faith. In fact, he was showing good faith towards the people who were his opponents and towards people who had certainly not at that time accepted his faith. Okay, so we've introduced the notion of bir by reference to verse 177 of uh, chapter two. Um, now we will uh, talk a little bit about relationships of kin. So the duty to maintain relations of kin, uh, first and foremost, most comes from uh, Surah Al-Nisa, uh, chapter four, verse one. Uh, this is uh, on the second page of the handout, I believe, uh, if, uh, although actually, you know, yours is more condensed than mine, so it's probably on the first page, in fact. So chapter four, verse one. Um, and first thing to maintain, mention here is that the address of this verse itself shows that its scope is to all mankind and not just to adherence to a particular faith, ya ayyuhan nas. And when verses of the Quran are proposing regulations simply for believers, they always say things like ya ayyuhan ladina amanu, you who have believed. But here the address is ya ayyuhan nas, all of mankind is addressed here. And verses of the Quran would have been propagated and tried to reach out to a, a wider audience than simply adherence to, to the faith, because some things would only have been acceptable to members of the faith, but other things would have been acceptable to a wider audience. So re, um, relations of kin, for example, were sacred amongst the Arabs as a, as a generic principle. And so the Quran is appealing to the Arabs and to people in general, ya ayyuhan nas, ittaqu rabbakum, fear your Lord, alladhi khalaqakum, who created you, min nafsin wahida, from one soul. So again, there's this sense of unity of all mankind, that you were created from one soul. Wa khalaqa minha, zawjaha, and created from it, his, his partner, spouse, and then dispersed many men and women from this, 
Uh, and then Wattaqullah, again, a second mention of Ittaqullah. So fear God is mentioned twice in this verse. And that in itself is an indication of the gravitas of the verse that it's mentioned twice. Alladhi um, tasa'aluna bihi, through whom you ask one another so that you invoke God in your dealings with one another. This is again, a sense of sanctity in the verse and sacredness being mentioned that the name of God that you invoke in your dealings with one another. So there's a sense of sanctity and elevation. in the verse. And then the key word, wal arham, and here it's translated as the wounds, but it means literally the relationships which are through the womb, i.e. kinship, relationships of kin. And then, in Allah kana alikum raqiba, that God is watchful over you. Again, this is an indication that there will be sanctions and liability for people who don't take this seriously, that God is watchful. And so this verse is really emphasizing uh, how important it is to maintain relationships of kin. Um, here, Arazi mentions uh, a, a few comments um, about the verse. He says, Li ziyadat shafaqat al khalq ba'dihim al al ba'd. So that God mentioned this relationships of kin to increase the shafaqa, meaning the kindnesses, the compassion of creation. And khalq here meaning creation, not meaning believers at all. Ba'dihim al al ba'd, some of them amongst others. So each towards the other. So this is generic. So to increase compassion within them for each other. And there's a lovely um, uh, quote, uh, quotation in the Quran in chapter 20, verse 94, which I uh, would like to just mention to you as well, that when Moses is angry with his brother Aaron, uh, when he comes back from the mountain and finds that his people have strayed from the, from the path of Tawheed, of worshiping one God, and he's angry at his brother and he grabs him by the beard. And Aaron, uh, in, in verse 94 of chapter 20, Aaron responds, Yabna Ummah. He says, O son of my mother, and he doesn't, he could have said, oh, my brother, but he invokes the relationship of the womb to seek, to conciliate him, to uh, calm him down. He says, oh, son of my mother. And so by mentioning the mother, which is the relationship of the womb, he seeks to calm his wrath and to say, look, remember that we came from the same womb. Um, and it's a very, very beautiful sort of uh, example and illustration of that point, actually. Just uh, on the same point, um, uh, I've mentioned that this is a seminal verse on the subject of kinship. Again, this is verses also Medinan. So another thing I just want to point out again, that another seminal conciliation verse, which is Medinan. And also um, another narration that is mentioned, a prophetic narration, which Razi mentions in his tafsir, uh, is that uh, God says, I am a Rahman. My name is a Rahman, the merciful. And it is a Raham, meaning the womb is called a Raham in Arabic. I have derived its name from my name. So whoever joins it, I will join with him. And whoever cuts it off, I will cut off from him. So all of these um, sayings, are uh, illustrations to indicate that this is a fundamental principle and it's not one that is lightly set aside. And this is important because, you know, I will mention that, you know, other commentators sometimes say that these don't apply in the context of uh, in, in, uh, interfaith uh, relationships that, that some of these principles can be set aside and I'm trying to explain really that this is very fundamental um, and it's not something that you can lightly set aside because the Quran has gone to a lot of trouble to emphasize emphasize its gravitas I've mentioned already the story of Joseph uh, which illustrates how important the the relationships of kin are and how Joseph brings his family back together again um, despite the brother's treatment of him Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the status of parents um, as an example of kinship. Um, and this is one illustration of uh, this, uh, the preservation of, of, of uh, relationships, even across a difference of faith. So I'm going to turn to verse uh, 23 of chapter 17. So chapter 17, verse 23. Um, I've included there chapter nine, verse 23, which is the verse which Levi, who I'm going to refer to in a minute, quotes. So I've included that for your reference, but the one that I'm going to discuss first is chapter 17, verse 23. And this is um, a very interesting passage, um, actually, that the whole passage that um, this verse is located within is one which has been compared to the 10 commandments. So what I'm illustrating here is that this passage from chapter 17, a short series of verses, has actually been com um, commentators, including Islahi, who, who writes the commentary here, have argued that this is the Quranic equivalent of the Ten Commandments. 
meaning that it contains similar regulations, commands and prohibitions. And I mention this because it indicates again, the gravitas of these verses. They are fundamental, they are sacred, uh, and they are emphatic in their style. In fact, they are legislative in their style, as I will explain as well. So again, they are not lightly to be set aside. So the verse begins, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ And qadha meaning a decree. A qadi in Arabic is referred to as a judge who can pass sentence. So his decree is, if you like, final. Um, so وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ Your Lord has decreed Allah ta'budu illa iyah That you not worship anyone except him. And this is obviously the fundamental doctrine of Tawheed. The, mo the most fundamental theological doctrine there is in the Quran. Immediately after it, conjoined with the wow al-ataf here, um, meaning that the two concepts are conjoined with this wow, wa, uh, which is between them, we find the phrase wa bil walidayni ihsana, which means that there should be gracious conduct towards the parents. And so this verse has just these two concepts juxtaposed, balanced side by side, that you worship one God, and you show gracious conduct towards your parents. And this is your Lord's decree in a passage which is the equivalent of the Ten Commandments. It's extremely sacred, extremely fundamental, and really, really emphatic in its style. And then it explains that if uh, you find that they have reached old age in your lifetime, either one of them or both of them, then don't ever say uff to them, meaning that you shouldn't be um, show any distaste in your dealings with them. You shouldn't sort of, uh, you know, just that grunt that you sometimes make when you're a bit unhappy, uh, if they ask you to do something, etc. You shouldn't say that. And do not repel them. And this is the positive. So those are the negatives, what you shouldn't do. What you should do is that you should speak to them with which is speech which honors them and restores their honor, maintains their honor and their dignity. And I go on to mention there, I've given you some examples from chapter 19, which is Surah Maryam, the chapter of Mary um, in, the, in the Quran. And I've put down three or four lines there because just to give context to the verses which I give as examples, chapter 19 verses 12 to 15 gives the example of Yahya, John the Baptist in the Quran. His character is described. Ya Yahya, O oh Yahya, khud al bi quwa. hold on to the scripture firmly. We gave him wisdom whilst he was still in his youth. It mentions his qualities. And then it mentions, among, and this is a very brief list of his, of his main characteristics, his most praiseworthy characteristics. It's a character profile of a prophet in the Quran, John the Baptist. It says, That he was dutiful to his parents and he was not tyrannical or disobedient towards them. And this is mentioned in a handful of choice qualities which you mentioned about his character. It says, وَسَلَامٌ عَلَيْهِ Peace be upon him. يَوْمَ وُلِدَ وَيَوْمَ يَمُوتُ وَيَوْمَ يُبْعَسُ Upon the day that he, he uh, will die, the day, that he, um, the day that he was born, the day that he died, and the day that he will be raised again. And after that, uh, verses 30 to 33 of the same surah talk about the prophet Jesus, in, according to the Quranic scripture. And here... Jesus says, and these are his words quoted in the Quran, and it's apparent from the preceding verses. Qala, inni Abdullah, I'm the servant of God. Atani al kitab, he has given me the scripture. Waja'alani nabiyan, he's made me a prophet. And then the verses continue. Waja'alani mubarakan ayna makunti, he's made me blessed wherever I am. Wa awsani bis salat, and he has enjoined upon me prayer. Wa zakat and charity. Ma dum tuhayya, as long as I remain alive. Wa barram bi walidati, that he has. This is how he has made me, that God has created me in this way. He has tasked me with certain things. He has honored me and blessed me with certain things. And he has made me barram bi walidati, dutiful towards my mother. Walam yaj'alni jabbaran shaqiya. And he has not made me uh, oppressive or uh, tyrannical in my dealings with her. Wassalamu alayya, the same formula, peace be upon me, the day I was born, the day I will die, and the day I will be raised again. So these two um, sort of passages come from chapter 19, the chapter of Mary. But again, these prophets are presented, their character profiles are presented as role models for people. And the quality of being dutiful to parents is emphasized through their qualities. Now, having mentioned all of this, so in the social structure of Islam, uh, Levi uh, writes that although the 
duty of Ihsan towards parents is enjoined at uh, chapter 17, verse 23, is based on human kinship. He, he believes that, he argues that it is only for believers, meaning it is only for the case where a believer has a believing parent or a Muslim has a Muslim parent. And that's what that Quranic obligation applies for. He says the converse doesn't seem to be true because, and he cites verse 23 of chapter nine, uh, which says, oh, you who have believed, do not take your fathers or your brothers as allies if they have preferred disbelief over belief. And whoever does so among you, then it is those who are the wrongdoers. So he quotes this verse to say that this principle only applies intra-faith. Now, I hope that I have already shown you that this is a sacrosanct principle, that it is addressed to mankind in general, that um, previous prophets, you know, pre-Islamic prophets have been presented as role models of this quality of being dutiful towards their parents, uh, and that the verse itself is couched in terms which are legislative and fundamental and sacred. And so, in fact, um, I would argue that verse 23 of chapter 9 is in the context of conflict. It's a conflict situation. And in fact, 23 is only 18 verses after Ayat al-Qital, verse 5 of Surah al-Tawbah, which is the famous sword verse, which talks about conflict. And the surrounding verses have, present qualifications for when conflict should occur, when it shouldn't occur, etc. So in that context of a live conflict, it is mentioned that relationships of kin should not be allowed to interfere with the loyalties of the, the, the two opposing sides in a military context. And that's it. In fact, the general principle about kinship is presented in the next verse on your list, which is Surah Luqman, chapter 31, verse 13 to 15, uh, which mentions the sage Luqman. He's advising his son. And this is a famous passage where he gives his son various pieces of advice. And he says, لا تشرك بالله وإذ قال لقمان لابنه وهو يعده يا بني أو my son لا تشرك بالله don't associate partners with God in the shirk the ظلم العظيم and then after this the Quran says ووصينا الإنسان بوالديه and we have enjoined upon man care for his parents and so this verse goes on talking about the contribution of the mother how she carries the child in weakness and this is now the divine voice is saying أنشكر لي that you be grateful to me Wali wali day, and also your parents. And the divine voice again saying, be grateful to your Lord and to your parents. Masir, to me is your return. And after this, uh, it, uh, at verse 15 of chapter 31, the Quran says, Wa in jahadaka, if they endeavor or strive ala and tushrika bi, to make you associate partners with me. This is, remember, the cardinal sin in Islam is to, is to associate partners with God. This is contravening Tawheed, which is principle number one. Something that, of which you have no knowledge. Don't obey them in this. So this is uh, something which I refer to in my research as differentiate, differentiation, where the Quran differentiates between different scenarios. And it says, look, in as far as they are insisting that you associate partners with God, you shouldn't obey them in that because that obviously contravenes your own faith. But it says, وَصَاحِبْهُمَا فِي الدُّنْيَا مَعْرُوفَ And this is the general principle. Sahibhuma means that you should accompany them fit dunya in this world, or potentially a translation could also be in worldly matters, i.e. non-theological matters. Ma'rufa meaning with appropriate kindness in the way that is customary to treat your parents. And so this is in fact the general principle of parental relationship, a, a child, and a parent relationship where there is a difference of faith. So even though the parent has a different faith, the child is not permitted to mistreat or cut off from that parent in any way, but should be a dutiful child towards the, the, the parent. The only thing is that in the matter of theological doctrine, they should obviously maintain their own, own beliefs. But in terms of duties that are owed to a parent, in terms of companionship, and in terms of um, taking care of their needs, maintaining contact with them, et cetera, that should all be maintained. Okay, so time is, is progressing uh, as I feared it would uh, a pace. So I'm going to keep moving along. Um, so I'm going to now look at uh, chapter 60 um, and a couple of the verses from there. 
So I'm actually, I think, very, very briefly, just by way of introduction, just to mention that um, sometimes the interpretation of some of these verses also comes from the attitude to the Quranic verses that commentators have. And so some, uh, Islahi, for example, who I mention here a lot, he has a, a kind of a standard argument where he says that the prophet was supposed to be at, at uh, loggerheads with the Makkans until they came round to his, his, his sort of theological ideas. Um, and he kind of maintains that notwithstanding what else comes along the way in terms of Quranic verses along the way. In the same way, some commentators in the past have taken the view that Ayat al-Khital, the sword verse, which argues for conflict in a particular situation, somehow abrogated all verses in the Quran that talk, called for peaceful relations uh, with other faiths, for example. Again, that's, it's, it's a take, um, and I argue against that in the book in, in terms of this wholesale approach where you say, well, everything that's peaceful in the Quran is simply ab abrogated by one verse. Um, I, 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 you know, I argue against that extensively. My own position is that verse 256 of Surah Al-Baqarah, which is the verse after Ayat Al-Kursi, the throne verse. So it's a very special position in the Quran. It says, La ikraha fi deen, there is no compulsion in religion. And that's the Sankrasak principle that you cannot compel someone to change their faith. And that's the basic position. Um, but um, I just mentioned that here because um, some of the verses which I discuss, um, some commentators say that these verses, you know, have been abrogated um, by the verses that, that, that deal with conflict and that somehow anything about, ver you know, harmonious dealings with people of other faiths somehow abrogated. Razi, for example, um, says, بَاطِن, that this is invalid, that this line of argument is invalid. Um, that he's being a very authoritative commentator. He, he doesn't have much time for that approach. So chapter 60, verse one. Um, so here um, I'm going to talk about, again, another uh, verse, which apparently talks about not having good relations with people of uh, a different faith. So it says, verse one, chapter 60, Ya amanu, O you who believe, la tattakhidu, do not take aduwi, my enemy, wa aduwakum, and your enemy, awliya. Awliya can mean friends, but it can also mean supporters. It's the plural of wali. Um, the, the Quran talks about God being the protector of the believers, uh, um, that he's waliyu ladina amanu, that he is the supporter, the protector, and the friend uh, of those who have believed. So don't take my enemy and your enemies as friends or supporters. Tulquna ilayhim bil mawadda, you uh, reach out to them with mawadda, which is love, affection. Waqad kafaru, and they have disbelieved bima ja'akum in what came to you, min al haq of the truth. But then crucially, so this sounds like don't take people who disbelieve in your scripture as friends. I mean, as a very simple reading, but actually what it's saying is awliya, meaning don't rely upon them in a battle context because look, there's a history. It says, rasula wa iyakum. they have cast out the messenger and yourselves, i.e. from your own city of Mecca. Uh, and tu'minu billah, simply because you believed in Allah, uh, Rabbikum, your Lord, in kuntum kharajtum jihadan fi sabili, if it is that you have migrated to this other city in, in my path, mardati, and for my pleasure. Tusiruna ilayhim bil mawadda. So secretly you seek to have affection with them. Wa ana a'lamu bima akhfaytum. And I know very well what you hide. And so on, the verse continues. Now, as I said, on the face of it, this seems like. Uh, it's saying don't have good relations with people who don't believe in the same scripture as you. And Islahi, uh, he argues that this is a basis for ta'alluq, which means cutting off of all ties. He, he, he argues that this was kind of like a last straw that, you know, up till now, some people in Medina had kept good relations with their kin uh, uh, in Mecca. But at this point, this was saying you now have to cut off completely. You know, enough is enough. You know, you, you are separate. They are separate. You know, you're not the same people. Now, I argue against him um, uh, and I present context for my argument, but just talking about his own position, um, he himself are, accepts that a later verse, which I will present to you, actually has a more narrow um, uh, message. And also his take on things, I would argue, is often very exaggerated. So as an example, uh, chapter 109 in the Quran states, Lakum dinukum that, that the Prophet should say to the Meccans, your religion is for you and my religion is for me. And most commentators take this as 
um, an indication that, you know, of live and let live, that I'll stick to my faith, you stick to your faith. But he talks about it as abadi mufaraqat or elane jang. In Urdu, this means that there is everlasting sort of difference between you and us, and there's a, 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 a almost a proclamation of war. So he's I, my argument is that he's very exaggerated in the way in the message he takes from um, various verses. He he always he takes an extreme interpretation, and I argue that he's done so here as well. In fact, Razi provides the sabab and nuzul. The circumstances of revelation of this verse. He says that this verse, um, chapter, verse one of chapter 60, um, was in fact dealing with a situation where secret assistance had been offered to the enemy, i.e. the Meccans in war. It was the Prophet's intention to march on Mecca and uh, an individual called Hatib bin Abi Balta had secretly attempted to divulge to the Meccans, the Prophet's military secrets. Um, about making that a movement. And he professed his desire thereby to preserve his financial interests and family connections in Mecca. And that's why he did it out of personal interest. And he was intercepted as it happens by the companions of the prophet who wanted to take vengeance upon him and the prophet and the, and the, and the prophet calmed them down and, and, and stopped them from doing that. So there was an explicit context to this verse. It's not something that talks about not maintaining relations across faith at all. And in fact, the general principle is given in, in the later verses, um, again, once again, as I point out in these passages, that it's not the headline which gives you the, the, the um, general principle. The general principles are given in those verses which I have said to you, which are sacrosanct and which have legislative language. These verses which talk about not maintaining relations are contextual, they must be read in context, and they have exemptions, and the general principles are reiterated further down. So in verse uh, seven, for example, of chapter 60, it is said, Asallahu an yaj'ala baynakum wa bayna alladhina aadaytum minhum mawadda. It may be, and Razi, in fact, says that Asa here means that it is a promise from God. Asallah means that God will definitely bring this about. Asa can mean maybe, or it can mean uh, that it's a promise. Asallahu an yaj'ala baynakum, that God will make between you, wa bayna alladhina aadaytum, and your enemies, minhum mawadda. Mawadda meaning that there will be a strong affection and love between you. And then the key verse, really, which is probably the one of the most fundamental verses of this presentation, uh, verse 8 of chapter 60, that la yanhaakum Allah, God does not forbid you, anil uh, lam yuqatilukum, with regards to those who do not fight um, with you, Fiddin, uh, because of your religion, and they never turned you out from your homes, and that you have be behaved dutifully towards them. And tabarru is a verb derived from the noun bir. It's saying that you may, you should behave dutifully towards those people, even who have a different faith, provided they are not at war with you. They have not been responsible for persecuting you and turning you out of your homes and tabarruhum, that you behave dutifully towards them, i.e. you show bir towards them, i.e. maintain your kinship, maintain social assistance, and وَتُقْسِتُوا إِلَيْهِمْ and that you deal with them with justice. And justice, again, is a transcendent principle. And one of the commentators has also mentioned that تُقْسِتُوا إِلَيْهِمْ may be a reference to maintaining ties of kinship, because that is a form of justice, that you maintain the duties of kinship. So that all of this should be maintained, and there's no prohibition on that at all. And some of the examples um, in the seerah, which are mentioned um, in Razi's tafsir here, are uh, that Umm Habiba uh, was um, the daughter of the Meccan chieftain Abu Sufyan. So she was the daughter of the leader of the opponents of the Prophet in Mecca. The, the leader being a disbeliever at that time, Abu Sufyan. Uh, the Prophet married his daughter, Umm Habiba, when she became Muslim. And as a result of that, Razi says that Abu Sufyan's attitude towards the Prophet and the Muslims softened noticeably. So by maintaining those ties of kinship, it provided an avenue for future softening of relations. In the same way, another example is given is uh, of Asma bint Abu Bakr, that Abu Bakr, the closest friend of the Prophet, that his daughter Asma, again, that she had perhaps not extended the courtesy due to her mother uh, when she visited as a result of her being a disbeliever at that stage. And, and again, it was mentioned that this command was given that you should behave dutifully towards your mother, notwithstanding differences of faith. So again, these, the duties of kinship 
uh, etc., should be maintained um, irrespective of differences of faith, providing opportunities for people to come, come together. I'm, I'm wrapping up very soon. I'm conscious of the time. And so the last point I really just want to mention is the point about social assistance. Um, so I want to just mention here um, chapter 76, verse 8, um, uh, which mentions uh, the people of paradise. It mentions the conduct of the people of paradise. So it portrays a picture of, of the people of paradise and the rewards they will have, the pleasure of God, etc., in, in paradise. And then it sort of rewinds back to their conduct on earth and says, well, what was the conduct that they showed on earth that sort of led to them having these wonderful rewards in paradise? And it says, And they used to feed people uh, despite their love for it, despite their own need of it. So miskin meaning the, the poor, yatim meaning the orphans, wa asira, captives. Now, captives in particular, again, this shows that this is not to do with people of the same faith. Because again, uh, Razi and other mentions that this is referring to the captives that were taken in conflict between the Muslims and the non-Muslims of Mecca at that time. So these were the polytheists um, who were taken as captive in battle. And the Quran is lauding those people who share the food that they have with the people they have taken captive um, in those wars. That they in fact is saying that you have a duty of birr you have social assistance duties towards those people whilst they are in your captivity because they are therefore in your care. They're separate from their own kin, they're away from their property, they're away from their food, and it is your responsibility to look after them whilst they are in that situation. So miskin and wayatiman wa asira, also captives are mentioned. And Ar-Razi um, mentions um, Razi mentions uh, in his uh, explanation of these verses of uh, chapter 76, verse 7 and 8. Chapter 7 mentions that they were fearful of God um, and, and they, were, uh, they were mindful of the day of judgment. And then chapter uh, and verse 8 talks about them feeding people. And Razi mentions a quotation here, which I want to mention to you especially um, here, that this is uh, honoring God's command and showing compassion towards God's creation. So he distills all of the obligations um, of the religious obligations within this phrase. He says, ta'ala wa ala khalqillah. And that's really my concluding message today, uh, that all the religious obligations can be distilled down to these two essentials. And these are both to do with internal transformation. Ta'adhim li amrillah means honoring the command of Allah. And that honor is in the heart that once God has commanded something, be it worship, etc., that, that the, the adherent to the faith respects that. And it's the washafaqa ala khalqillah, compassion toward God's creation. And this is all of creation. It's not restricted to people of a particular faith. And shafaqa is again, the quality of compassion, which is again, a quality of the heart. And this is the internal transformation that the Quran is arguing for. I'll stop there. There is more to say, but you know, time doesn't permit it. Um, I've had to summarize some of the later sections, but I think it's important to obviously give people time to respond and to discuss the material. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.